The aim of this session is to look at how to check normal distribution using SPSS. Here's a data file. Uh, you'd have seen this one before in terms of setting up data files for SPSS in, JAP, in JASP. So this is the reaction times in a congruent situation, reaction time in an incongruent situation, and their exercise grouping. I've used numbers over here in terms of value labels, and this is the string variable I brought in from the Excel file. In order to check the distribution of the data, you need to go to the Analyze menu, Descriptive Statistics, and Explore. Now, my window will open up a little bit larger because I've been working with this one a while, so therefore your window might open up a little bit smaller. You need to move the variable you wish to check over. I'm going to choose both of my variables, my repeated measures variables, and move them into the dependent list. If you have repeated measures variables, they go in the dependent list. It's a slightly odd situation here because you think dependent variable in the dependent list and you're looking at these going, well, hang on, there's some independent variables there as well. This is just the way SPSS is designed. Your grouping variable goes in the factor list. Now, that is always the case where you have a nominal level variable where you set up value labels that should go in your factor list. Click on the plots menu over here on the right hand side, add histograms. I personally choose to remove stem and leaves, and you can add normality plots with tests. This is slightly more advanced statistical stuff, which I will be dealing with at level two, year two, level five, going forwards. Continue, and then OK. The output will then open in a new SPSS window, output window, and it's running examined down there. OK, so we now get the information that we've got about the number of participants in the separate groups. There were 20 control, 15 in the mod moderate, and 16 in the RAST. That's the same for both of our repeated measures variables. We get a nice long table here, which gives us lots of information in relation to our descriptive statistics. So within this table, you'll see mean values, median values, standard deviations, the minimum and maximum to work out the range, your interquartile range, and then your skewness and ketosis values, which I'll come back to when we actually go through the checking of the distribution. That'll happen for all the separate groups and for your two variables. Below the table, you get your tests of normality. You get a Kolgamov Shmernoff and a Shapiro Wilk tests. This is much this is the level five second year stuff that I would be talking to you guys about in terms of how they work. I do not teach this at first year level four. Below the tables, we see our first histogram coming up for the control group. And in terms of checking these, you can double click onto the graph and add the line of best fit. The normal distribution is the one selected automatically. Thanks very much, SPSS, and I shall close these windows. And the objective is to try and assess how closely your bars follow the curve. Okay, This curve has been fitted assuming normal distribution given the mean given the standard deviation it's not like a line of best fit that follows what the curves are this one close but we've got a quite high peak up here i scroll down to the next histogram this one here double click onto it add my line of best fit close there this one's got the peak in the middle again, and what appears to be a quite a long tail out to the right, suggesting some positive skew. This final histogram, double click on that, add the normal distribution curve, looking far more bell shaped in its distribution. So I'd be surprised this is, if this wasn't normally distributed. Below, we have some QQ plots where we'd want to look at how closely the Little circles follow the line. The closer they follow them, the better. We can see that throughout. You'll see different versions of those. But again, it's just basically how closely do these points follow those lines? The further away they are, the more problems we're likely to encounter. Keep scrolling down. We get to some box plots. Box plots help us identify again the spread of data, and in particular cases, outline outliers. Little circles like this would indicate an outlier, scores that are more than 1.5 to 3 interquartile ranges above, in this particular case, the 75th percentile, same is applied for below, 
or extreme values, which is the case of number 35 up here. Scroll down, I was going to scroll down and have a look at the last lot. Here's some more histograms. I won't bore you by pressing all the buttons again. You could do that in your own time in terms of what you're looking for. Let's have a little look again here. Extreme values, extreme value, and an outlier. So those are my graphical checks for distribution, always worth considering. The graphical checks uh, represent the skinny and ketosis values above. Depending upon your sample size, it will make them in terms of how easy they are to interpret. At larger sample sizes, it's often the case that we will rely much more on the graphical checks than we would on the numerical checks because of how those numerical checks are calculated. At smaller sample sizes, where we are here, sometimes, as I'll talk about this histogram again, which appears to have a slight problem over here on the right hand side and a, and a hint of quite a peak here, the histograms can be slightly hard to interpret. So here's my explore table, which I pointed out before, which had the skewness and ketosis values in. Okay, now in terms of checking the distribution, it is the skewness value divided by the standard error of skewness and ketosis divided by the standard error of ketosis. Now I could quite easily open up a a calculator down here and work my way through the many calculations. What I'm going to choose to do is try and do this a little bit faster. So I'm going to copy special, and make sure I just have the Excel worksheet option chosen. Click on OK. Go to a, a blank Excel file. And paste in the table. OK. Now, skewness divided by the standard error of skewness. For those of you who are familiar with Excel, just need to set up a little equation here. And there's my first one. And the beauty of this, so I can just double click and it will calculate all the same values. Now, I'm just going through here and removing the checks that I do not need. I don't need these extra calculations. I only need those for skewness and ketosis. So I don't want to be misleading or misread any information. As I look at the values here, values that exceed 1.96 or 2 are indicative that our data does not come from a normally distributed population. When looking at that histogram, that for the control group in the first reaction time, which I'll just quickly just go back to here, it was suggested that there may be some positive skew with the tail out to the right hand side. Positive value here is supporting that interpretation. For the warm up group, again, that histogram suggested that there was much more positive skew. This case, much more easily to interpret, much easier to interpret. Again, a slightly larger value. In this particular case, the ketosis value is much higher as well, indicating issues with the width and spread and the number of points within the tails, which is what ketosis is looking at. So as I go through, what I like to do personally is I like to highlight the bits that are causes of concern to indicate where there is a lack of normal distribution. This is just a habit I've got into to make it slightly easier for me to read these files later on and determine where we are lacking normality. Now, as I look through the RAST and the control group in the incongruent, not normally distributed, the warm up group and the control group in the congruent not normally distributed. This would then influence the choice of tests I would then use in terms of determining where differences are.